Hello, I'm Dr. Randall Secrets, your host for eOrthopod TV. Today we'll be talking once again remotely with Dr. William Seeds. Dr. Seeds is an orthopedic surgeon who practices in Ashtabula, Ohio. Dr. Seeds is also a sports medicine physician who provides sports medicine services to the Great Center in Geneva, Ohio. Thanks for joining us today, Dr. Seeds. It's my pleasure to be here, Randy. Thanks for having me again. Well, Dr. Seeds, what I thought we would discuss today is a, a fairly common condition that involves the elbow, and that's a condition called olecranon bursitis. You know, I think people are very familiar with the term bursitis. I, I'm not certain that people understand what bursitis is all the time. So let's start out by giving a description about olecranon bursitis, what, what it, what's causing bursitis and, and how it manifests in the patient. Well, Randy, this is typically something that I'll see that's been usually manifesting. It's, it's been presenting for quite a while in these patients where they'll, they'll tell me they've had this going on for many months. Uh, usually it's someone who is in an activity where they're resting their elbow on a, uh, they're typically a driver or they're doing something in the office where their elbow is always on an area where there's some type of compression or it's happened from a specific trauma where they've had an injury to the elbow and then all of them get what they would call a swelling, a mild swelling and a painful to palpation um, and it just doesn't go down and it, it, it stays in what we would call inflamed. And that's usually how, uh, how those will present to me. It's rarely that I see those when they've just happened. It, it's usually they've been going on for quite a while. Well, let's talk a little bit about the anatomy of the elbow and, and, and talk to uh, patients a little bit about the area we're talking about. You know, the olecranon is the tip of the elbow that you can feel uh, right at the tip of the elbow, and it's actually the proximal portion of the ulna that um, um, forms that part of the elbow joint. And the bursa is actually a, uh, a sac that sits between the, the skin and the uh, uh, the bone of the olecranon and allows the skin to glide easily over the tip of the olecranon. And bursas are all over our body. Uh, we have bursas between tendons and bone. We have bursas between two tendons, bursas between muscles, and in the case of the olecranon bursa, uh, a bursa that's, that's actually between the skin and the bone. And it allows the skin to glide. And generally speaking, um, that's what the function of bursas are. Um, I think when we're talking about bursitis, what we're really talking about is, is a, an inflammation of the bursa. And lots of things, as you've just described, can cause inflammation of the bursa and lead to both swelling and thickening of the bursa to the point to where it causes pain. Um, what do you typically see when you're examining a patient that has bursitis? When they come to the orthopedist office, uh, how far advanced is the, is the condition? Well, usually, as I said, it's been a while that uh, they've let it go and it's become more painful and just swollen. Uh, and um, my, my initially on my exam, my focus is to rule out an infectious type of bursa where I might have to make some decisions a lot sooner on recommending the possibility of surgery or antibiotics um, and that type of approach versus just a, a presentation of uh, a typical bursitis. And uh, that's where you'll see more uh, pain to palpation, um, uh, uh, a swelling uh, and that's tender. Um, and I, I do see some that are, that are inflamed, uh, that are kind of inflamed but not painful to touch. You're, a, you're able to palpate around it and it's just a chronic uh, bursal swelling that they have um, where those patients aren't really complaining much of pain but just of a... On just a, a pain or a, uh, a problematic bursa that's a problem with putting their arm down and in contact with anything and they just want it, want it taken care of. Well, let's talk a little bit about the difference between the infectious or the septic bursitis that you just referred to and the, the type that's more chronic. Because I think that's an important distinction patients need to understand. You know, I think infection is much more dangerous than than just the regular old irritated bursitis. What should a patient look for to distinguish and be concerned that they may in fact have an infection in a bursa rather than simply a degenerative bursitis? Uh, those, those patients usually present with uh, a significant amount of pain 
but also with a painful range of motion. They're, they also have pain with flexion extension where they're limited and they have more of a swelling not just around the elbow but it's in the soft tissue also. There's, there's usually an associated cellulitis or red, swelling red uh, soft tissue um, around the forearm of the, uh, of the elbow. So they'll present with, with those factors. They may complain of some fevers, um, but those, and sometimes they'll have a little drainage from the site also. Um, so those type of things are, are things those people will describe and, and present with in an in infected bursa. Yeah, now what do you think causes the infected bursa? How does a bursa become infected? Uh, typically we find it, um, it, it, it's usually related to um, uh, either the, the patient has been uh, scratching or rubbing around that area where there might have been a, a small nick or a, a scab that they've pulled off and, and they've introduced bacteria into that area or a lot, of, a lot of times as we do as these patients present we'll take x-rays and we'll see little slivers of metal or, or a, some type of foreign body that may be present where the, um, uh, the infection was introduced by just something that, that penetrated the skin or, or soft tissue there. Uh, and in terms of evaluation, when you're worried about an arth a, septic arth or a septic bursitis where there's infection, how does that differ from the way you may treat just a typical uh, bursitis that you think is just coming from irritation? Well, usually we want to, if it's infectious, we want to act pretty quickly because it is around a joint. We don't want it to progress into a septic joint uh, involving the whole joint. Um, usually we'll start them on an antibiotic with elevation um, and, and sometimes even immediately recommend operative intervention where we go in and remove an infected bursa if we think it's that significant. Usually though, I'll try to treat first with antibiotics and get the extremity elevated to reduce the swelling and then make a better decision about how they're responding to the antibiotic and, and then you know, how that bursa will respond to it. Um, and again, it just depends on how they progress with, with that uh, reaction to the antibiotic. And what about the regular uh, run of the meal degenerative bursitis or irritative bursitis? Uh, how do you evaluate the patient uh, that you suspect has just just that type of a process going on? Right. Usually, with the with that type of a presentation, I'm I will make the the uh, recommendation to actually aspirate the fluid from that that area, and uh, and then recommend putting in a little steroid into the site to help sclerose the. Uh, the bursa um, and to stop it from reaccumulating fluid again and a little compressive dressing and in trying to um, you know in, in trying to uh, restore that the anatomy of the elbow back pretty quickly and uh, usually we're pretty successful with just a one-time aspiration and injection there are some that that will recur with a, f a recurrence of fluid that will aspirate again and it's, if, if they do it more than uh, two times, then I'm usually, I'll make the recommendation of uh, thinking about surgically excising the cyst. But we're pretty successful with the um, aspirating that fluid and, um, and injecting a steroid. So, so let me paraphrase this and get this straight. When you see a patient with, with an olecranon bursa, with, when they've got swelling and fluid on the tip of the elbow there, you're going to evaluate the patient, first try to determine whether or not they, they may have an infection. If they have an infection, you may be a little bit more aggressive and be a little more concerned. But in both cases, you're going to put a needle into that bursa, draw off some fluid, and, and use that fluid to decide, one, whether it's infected, and two, to draw the fluid off to be able to decompress or, or drain that bursa and if you don't think it's infected at that point in time, you're going to go ahead and inject it with a corticosteroid and try to reduce the inflammation and try to uh, get that bursa to resorb and, and essentially go back to normal. Is that accurate? Yeah, that's correct, Randy. And, and if, I, if I do suspect infection, I, won't inje I will not inject the steroid after the aspiration. I'll, I'll wait to see, you know, I'll start the antibiotic and wait to see what we grow out. But other than that, that's exactly right. 
Now, now let's talk a little bit about imaging. You mentioned that, that you typically will always get an x-ray when, when you're evaluating an elbow with olecranon bursitis. Is that, is that accurate? Yes, that's correct. And what about an MRI scan or any additional imaging? Do you feel strongly that, that you need additional imaging to make this diagnosis or to rule out any other more serious complications? Uh, sometimes, uh, depending on, you know, if I have that question of infection and the amount of uh, soft tissue involvement, I might recommend the MRI. Uh, uh, if, it's, if it's something that's been with multiple recurrences where I've been aspirating and it, and it just seems to come back, I might recommend the MRI evaluation too. Um, I don't think it's absolutely necessary, but I think it can be useful in certain certain circumstances of, of evaluating it. Now, I think you mentioned that, that you'll try the aspiration in a non-infected uh, olecranon bursitis a couple of times before you move on to more aggressive treatment. What drives you to, to consider suggesting to the patient that surgery may be in their best interest? Well, um, number one, I don't want this progressing into, uh, into an infected type of bursal problem. Uh, and number two, it's, I, again, I leave it up to the patient. Uh, if, if I haven't been successful after a couple of times in, in draining this and, uh, and in introducing a sclerosin compound like a steroid to, to help in keeping it from swelling again or gaining fluid, that's when I'll give the patient the option of uh, potentially removing it. And let's talk a little bit about that surgical intervention. What does that involve? Well, as far as uh, surgical intervention is concerned, it's an outpatient type of surgery. Uh, it's typically a, a small incision over the olecranon area where we'll just remove the olecranon bursa and, um, uh, and basically um, close the skin. And uh, I will sometimes uh, I'll put a posterior mold or I'll put them in a brace for about 10 days um, where I'll let them do some passive range of activities until, the, until I know that the wound is healed and there's no drainage from the wound. Um, then I'll let them get back to their, usually to their normal activities. And once you've, you've, you've completed a surgical excision of a non-infected uh, bursa, uh, what do you find the recurrence rate is? Is this going to take care of the problem, or do you find that, that uh, you see these again forming uh, if, if later down the road? Uh, I, I would I'd say that most of these know that they, they've got a pretty good record of, um, of uh, being done with a problem initially. Um, I don't see many recurrences, but they do you do have to let the patients know that it is a possibility of where you don't, uh, that there can be recurrences of, of, of a collection of fluid where you haven't removed all of the bursa or there's been a, a regrowth of, of some of that tissue in that area. And do you, do you have any recommendations after the patient uh, has finished the surgery, finished the rehab, in terms of trying to reduce the recurrence rate? Do you either restrict the patient to certain activities or have them wear any sort of pad or anything like that? Yeah, depending on their occupation, if they're on a, on a computer or if they're uh, um, specifically, um, you know, like, like I discussed some of my truck drivers that typically will have their arm um, resting. I, I'll recommend a pad for a while and see how they do with that, but for most of these patients, um, I let them go back to their normal activities. You know, I think we probably ought to point out, we've talked about two different things here. One is the, is the infected olecranon bursa, and the other is the non-infected or the typical olecranon bursa. I, I think in my experience, the, the infected olecranon bursas are, are pretty uh, uncommon. It's not like it's 50-50 or anything like that. What's been your experience in terms of the percentage of, of infected olecranon bursas that you see versus just the, the, the typical sort of degenerative or inflammatory olecranon bursa? Well, I, I think because I, I, would, I would associate it more with the fact that they, people delay treatment with these a little bit more. And I would say the same, I, I'd say it's probably half and half that I see that are half of them are infected and half of them are, are just a, a typical uh, bursitis. And I think it's more because these typical bursitis start out and they're just neglected for a while and then they, 
they eventually progress into an infectious bursitis. Well, that's interesting information because your your recommendation then is is one of the reasons to have something done with this earlier rather than later is the risk of infection. And if you either treat it non-surgically and it goes away or you, you treat it non-surgically and it doesn't go away and then you, you treat it surgically, you're better off going ahead and getting it dealt with rather than let it just sort of drag on. Yeah, I, I absolutely think so because it is an area that the patient can't typically see and it's you know out of sight, out of mind and you're, they're always bumping it or scratching it or catching it or you know there's that constant repetitive th uh, process that's happening that they're just most of the time they're not aware of and and I think that's how they get into these problems with these uh, when when they do progress into an infectious process. Well I think that is useful information because I think all of us have a tendency to sort of consider this disease process more of a nuisance than anything else. You know it's not something that typically uh, an orthopedic surgeon considers dangerous or anything as long as it's not infected. But as you've pointed out, if it does get infected, it's a, it's a whole different sort of risk at that point. And that infection can not only cause significant problems, but spread into the joint and create more destruction. So I think that if, if that's one of the major risks, that is a, a, a reason to have a little bit more aggressive approach to, to treating olecranon bursitis early on. So thanks for that information. Well, I think this has been an excellent discussion, and I think we've probably covered most of the, the information that a patient needs to know about olecranon bursitis. Is there anything that you feel like that we need to share with patients that we haven't up to this point? No, other than that, that I think the sooner you seek treatment, the better you're going to do with something like this than, than waiting around. Um, and uh, I think you'll be able to get all those options of treatment. It's just you're going to have somebody observing it and, and understanding the potential problems of where it can progress. So I, I think you're better off supervised in, in trying to follow something like this. Well, thanks for that. I think that that is new information to me in terms of, of you know, the, the potential risk. And um, uh, I'm glad that, that we had a chance to talk about this and, and, and enlighten the patient. So Thanks so much for joining us today. Look forward to further discussions in uh, different topics in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. I appreciate you having me, and I look forward to seeing you again. Mm -hmm.